into our world with this mission as I pray to redeem us from what's been broken and lost in our lives, but also to restore us. And, and restore us, it's not, so it's not just get saved and stay the same. It's like he's trying to transform us into his likeness, which is such a cool thing God would do for us. Why would he care so much? But he does. And Jesus had disciples, not just the 12, but many men and women. And when he poured his spirit upon them, they too became missional or was intended for us to be missional as he was. But what does that mission look like? I mean, Jesus really was only here for three years working on this mission. And yet it had profound impact And if we look at his life, we see him heal people and teach the gospel and and disciple people. And and we as a church do those same things. But if that's all we see, we miss a key element to his mission. You see, what worked in America as a strategy in the past decades, many decades, no longer is effective. And, as I, and there's some things I want to share from this book, uh, Joining Jesus on His Mission by Great Finca, that really help bring home, like, wow, we can't think the same anymore. And so America was founded on Chris, Christian principles and truths. And in that light, no, we were never a Christian nation, but we, we carried the values and God's teachings of Christianity and created this, we wanted to be this country where there was this freedom for people to worship, but we were founded upon the things that Jesus brought to us. And all we had to do in our strategy was open the doors, build the building and open the doors because America valued these principles that even... The towns would make sure one of the first buildings, probably after the bar, I'm not sure, but was a church building. They wanted to be anchored around that. That was the place, the center of community of those towns. And so all we had to do for decades was just build the building, open the doors, preach the word, and people would come. But things shifted. And we started to become post-Christian as a nation. And people stopped coming as much as they did. And so then just maybe uh, two, three decades ago, we changed our strategy because we were becoming post-Christian like Europe and the attendance was going down. and, and, And so here we thought, Let's not just open the doors, but let's be contemporary. Let's provide ministries that meet felt needs. And that, too, was good because God cares. And and when the communicating is that God is part of your lives, not just on Sundays. And he cares about your families and your, and your troubles and your relationships. And so we went and so we created all this programming to help do that. And, but then again, things begin to shift. And the attendance became declining and drastic in those that were not coming. And we, we went from being a post-Christian to what I believe now we are a pre-Christian nation. You see, post-Christian means that people that grew up in a church no longer come. But now we are a nation where people have not gone to church anymore and have no understanding or interest of even attending. And so every new generation now is moving further away from Jesus and his church. Some... Statistics is millions of people who were members of churches have walked away. Millions, literally. Less than 10% of young adults participate in any local congregation. America, this is my point, 
America has become a mission field. There are more Christians today on Sunday meeting in church in China than there are in America. Yet it was America that sent missionaries to introduce them to Jesus. Ironically, the nations we sent missionaries to are now sending missionaries to us. Just this morning in, uh, in the news, CBN, Christian Broadcast News, you can read it, North, or South Korea has sent 240 Christians. They're here now praying in the major cities for a revival, an awakening of God in America. Are you getting this? The pastor, uh, they quote uh, one of the pastors, uh, J. Jun Choi, said, just, quote, just as the first missionaries from the U.S. came to our nation and spread the fire of the gospel, we want to bring the fire back to America. <laughs> Let's pray they're successful. <laughs> and our little churches. And he actually shared the story of how he, there was a Christian mar- missionaries that went and did revival meetings, and he remembers that, and that was instrumental in his family, and now he's coming back to, sh- to do the same here. So this, this should deeply burden us. It really should. It is about the numbers. But it's not that the numbers in themselves matter. Sometimes you hear, it's not about the numbers. Hey, the numbers matter. Because every number that attends the church is a person. And every person has been given a soul. And every person on this planet will either have an internal intimate relationship with Jesus forever or they will have hell. We cannot be indifferent. This is what Jesus was teaching. He spoke on these things, but in our attempts to be relevant and cultural and not offend anybody, we've avoided saying these things. But the truth doesn't change whether we speak it or not. Amen? Every person who follows Jesus in America is living in a mission field. And the question is, those that follow Jesus, will we join him on the mission, his mission, which is to what? To seek and save the lost, right? If we love God as he loves us, then we will also love what he loves. That makes sense? I've taught on that with Jill, you know, just, <laughs> I, I won't retell the story, but I had to learn to love her destroyed little koala bear when I married her that she had growing up with a missing eye and fur, and, and I had to learn, to, I was wanting to throw that thing out, and, uh, <laughs> and it's like I had to learn to love what Jill loves because I love her, and God loves the world. He loves the world and carries a burden for it in his heart that all people should come to know his son, Jesus Christ, and say, save me, be my Lord. And so the challenge is the church needs a different strategy than just opening its doors and preaching the word and offering ministry that meets needs. So, The title of the sermon is what I believe is important to Jesus' strategy. What's our strategy, missionally? To party with Jesus. (laughs) I hesitated saying that, and and my wife changed the title because I was party with the sinners, and she goes, this is Wisconsin. They're not going to understand that correctly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so it's party of Jesus. And so I don't want to be flippant with it. It's, it's actually true. 
is this is a key part of Jesus' strategy. But how does one party with Jesus? And so here's, there's four key elements to this strategy. And the first one is obvious because we've just come out of a long time of learning how to pray powerfully, strategically, how to pray for all kinds of prayers upward to God and prayers inward for transformation in our lives, but also prayers to be missional outward. And so obviously the first key is pray for your neighbors with Jesus. Do you know Jesus is praying for them? Will we join him in those prayers? Jesus, it says in Romans 8, he is continually interceding. He's not, he didn't finish his mission here. Go up to heaven, and he's chilling until we show up. He is still actively involved in his mission through his own prayers and working through you and me. But the key to being missional is not doing stuff before we pray things. Amen? So let me ask, where is your neighborhood? I've talked about this in the first message, but where is your neighborhood? Yes, literally, you have neighbors, one behind you, probably one in front of you, one on each side, in kitty corner. Literally, you have neighbors across the street. Take it to them, the prayers. But also, we have neighbors in our schools, as a student, right, as teachers, We have neighbors in different cubicles where we work or offices or assembly lines. So we have co-workers who are neighbors. We have neighbors in our clubs. We have neighbors in our sport teams and events. We have neighbors where we volunteer and help in different places. We have neighbors all around us. So the question is, where's your neighborhood? Who are your neighbors? John 10.10, I shared this in the first message, and it's kind of a, something that caught on and uh, others that have preached. But in John 10.10, Jesus says, we always start with the second half of the verse, Jesus saying, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Have it full. I don't want them half living, right? But we also, for, but we need to remember the first half of the verse, the thief comes only to steal, kill and destroy. So there, we do not live in a sp- spiritual Switzerland, even now you can't, I can't even use that metaphor now because they've taken sides. <laughs> but, but there is evil, and there's good, there's Satan, there's God, and Jesus came to defeat the enemy spiritually. But when he says, he came that may have life and have it abundantly, have full, what's he saying? that there is a world of people that are only mostly dead. And so I shared from uh, the the sermon, the slide, and it's just Princess Bride, and in that we we see Miracle Max there. It's hard to see him, um, but it says there is a big difference between mostly dead and all dead. Mostly dead is slightly alive. And so, yeah, just real quick. show. The, but anyway, you remember, if you haven't seen it, it's just a goofy, strange, fun movie. Um, and so that's, and I'm using that because when we look at our neighbors, and maybe they're m- richer and more successful than you are, or less problems, or they seem to have the family together, and we go, oh, man, they're fully alive. They're not, unless they have Christ. They're just... They are mostly dead, which means only partly alive. And they need Jesus Christ, right? All right, we can get the lights back on. And um, and so what I want to encourage you to do is think about how you can pray for these neighbors. And, and look at Luke 10, Luke 10, verse 2. And he said to them, Jesus speaking, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. 
Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You see, Jesus and the Father loves the world and desires everyone to be saved. And Jesus is saying, basically, there is an abundance of my love. There is no shortage of God's love. And there is an abundance of people ready to experience this love. What we have is a shortage of laborers, of disciples who will go and bring that message to those who actually are ripe to hear. Jesus said this. Was he exaggerating? Is there really an abundance? Well, if there's abundance of love, there's abundance of people. We may not just know it yet. I could, you know, you could hear, you know, the disciples going, yeah, well, you're the Messiah, and we're sure you can handle this problem, but yes, we'll pray for you like you asked. Don't we do that kind of like, oh, yeah, you know, someone's in trouble. I'll pray for you. But when Jesus said that, what's he really saying? Let's join me in this, in this harvest field. And so, You know, I guess you could even think of it like there's a, there's a world of people wanting new cars right now. And uh, let's say there's an abundance of new cars, and, and now we got an abundance of microchips to go in those cars, which I found out from the car dealership takes about 70,000. Or, yeah. And, uh, uh, no, what was it? No, I went blank. Let's say 70 per car. But anyway... But let's say there's, but we can't get the cars. People can't get their cars because there's a shortage of truck drivers, right? Kind of like, so that's kind of what we're needing, more truck drivers, more harvesters to be out there. And even in the next chapter of Luke, the Lord's Prayer of Luke, verse 2, Father, Jesus says, pray this way, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. When does... Jesus or the Father ever ask us to pray something, but we're to be non-participants in being the solution. Here I am. Send me. Here I am. Show me. Let me see this harvest field. So in the first key, ask yourself again, who are your neighbors? And we want you to take time each week to pray a blessing over them, your neighbors. Pray a blessing. Pray for an opportunity to connect with them. Pray for their salvation. Prayer walk your streets around your neighborhood and pray for each neighbor. If your neighborhood's in the office, prayer walk and pray a blessing upon each cubicle and opportunity for them to know Jesus. If, if your uh, neighborhood is, a, is in school, well, prayer walk your classrooms. You know, wherever your neighborhood is, would you commit yourself to prayer walking? The reason God's put this sermon series on my heart for the church at this time when we were all set up to start a different series is because we're entering summer though you can't tell today. But, uh, but this is our opportunity to connect and hang out in ways we don't normally get to or is more difficult because now people are outside a little bit more. Do you know who your neighbors are? Can you tell me their names, each one that's around just your location or the names of the co-workers that you work with or maybe their spouses. I don't know. Get to know them. Pray for them. That's the point. Second key to the strategy is to befriend, enjoy them, your neighbors like Jesus. In Luke 15, I'm just intentionally, all the Gospels, you can find these same kind of stories. But there's something very interesting about Jesus' strategy beyond prayer and preaching of the word and making disciples. So if we read verses 1 and 2 of Luke 15 and then verse 7, 
Listen to this. Here's a fascinating strategy. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So Jesus makes, t- you know, he's got a short time to rock the world with his mission. Yet, do you know how cumbersome and slow it is to change the world one dinner party at a time? That's insane. Who would come up? That's very inefficient, you would think. It's certainly not efficient time-wise. It takes time. You have to leave space in your calendar. Jesus, what are you thinking, man? It may not be efficient by American standards of how we accomplish things, but do you know what it is? Effective. We're not called to be efficient spiritually. We're called to be effective. And we can look at the results of this one man's dinner parties and say there's been a large impact. Verse 7, Jesus answers them, just so I tell you, in case you're not even convinced about the party idea, he tells the story about sheep and the shepherd who finds the one sheep that got lost. He left them all and then finds it, comes home and throws a party. He gets all his neighbors together and throws a party. And as a metaf- and an expl- explanation of the metaphor, could someone get me a glass of water, please? Um, got a scratchy throat. Or just give me your water. I'm not afraid of the germs. (coughs) Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Joy, happiness. Every time someone gets saved, heaven throws a party. And we walk around all serious and sour. Give me a break. Let's have fun. Do you not understand that Jesus' strategy is fun? Did you think, you know, all of a sudden, if now if I started this talking about evangelism, oh, if I have to. But what if evangelism is making friendships and having dinner parties or campfires or whatever? How cool is that as a strategy, right? Thank you. You, Rick, did you notice his nice blue suit coat? I think I'll come back to that later. (laughs) Oh, man, there was someone's water right there. Could have drank that. Okay. So now let's look at 19, just as another example, Luke 19, verses 5 through 7. I want you to just see this is not all over. The, I went through all <laughs> the gospel and looked at how many times Jesus is having meals, and I couldn't even begin to share them. There's so many, but just a couple key ones here. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, so he's in Jericho, and he sees this little guy up in the tree, and he says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. And so, and so he hurried and came down and received Jesus joyfully. And when he saw it, when they saw it, the crowd, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. There it is again. I like that sometimes Jesus is invited. But if no one's inviting him, he invites himself. I like to come to your house. You ever do that? <laughs> Hey, I'd like to come over. I'll bring dinner. But hey, how about I come over and we'll hang out or something, right? Zacchaeus was a tax collector who was despised, but especially Zacchaeus because tax collectors were traitors. They were betrayers of the faith because they took on business practices that agreed that were not godly. 
And so Jesus, when you hear tax collectors, that's like sinner times two in the eyes of other people. So think about that in our culture. Think about, okay, imagine the regular sinner. Okay, now imagine the worst in our culture today. The Christians say, oh, I can't go to that house or have them in mine. That's kind of what it's like. But this is the cool thing. We're going to jump out of uh, Luke for a second. And this is the coolest thing as, I, as we speak about strategy, Matthew eleven nineteen. So again, especially it's funny, the religious people, the world was going, hey, Jesus is a really cool guy. I like him. I would like to meet him. It's the religious people who are grumbling all the time or the self-righteous thinking they got their life all together. But in Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, it says, the Son of Man, Jesus says this, speaking, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Now, probably they're saying that because there was extravagant food and too much and a lot of alcohol, all right? Now, Jesus isn't the one that's a glunt and a drunkard, but he's hanging around those kind of people who are because he really loves them. He really, he's not putting up with them. He enjoys them. And they like to have a good time. Matter of fact, one of the members in our church I uh, had a, uh, a big party at his house with coworkers and said, hey, I'll provide all the food and drink. And when, when it was done, he noticed a, a lot of bottles <laughs> left behind, and they weren't just beer bottles, all right? Kind of like, because you can't trust a Christian to put a good party on. <laughs> so they brought the party with them, right? <laughs> Funny. Befriend and enjoy them like Jesus did. Can you imagine, because um, I want you to be turning now to the key passage for this morning as we look at this second key of befriend and enjoy them like Jesus. You see, Jesus, as you're turning there, let me just say, as Jesus, as Jesus is calling people to become followers and believers in him, they're experiencing something more than just powerful preaching and healing. If they become disciples of him, they enter into something called koinonia. Koinonia is the word translated in English, fellowship. And what this means is not just acquaintances or just friends, but this is a, a sharing of life spiritually at a soul level. And that only happens with Jesus being there. What other explanation can there be for these men and women to, to leave things behind them, to say, I will leave in these tax collectors, leaving the lucrative job, saying, I will drop this. James and John, we will leave the fishing, our family business, and we will follow you. There was something very attractional and powerful about not just inviting Jesus into your life, but you joining his. And these friendships would go deep. So now look at this passage in Luke 5, where we're going to anchor most of this morning now. After this, Jesus went out. And saw a tax collector. And we're going to read, look at verses 27 and just read the whole thing. 27 through 32. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed Jesus. Now probably he had already been introduced to Jesus on some level, either hearing some of the teachings, people telling him about Jesus. Um, so some, and so he has some context, but not much. But in Levi, 
And, and leaving everything, it says, he rose and followed Jesus. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. You see where I'm going with this? And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him, them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples. I like how they kind of, they like, we're not going to say it in front of them, but, hey, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus, obviously hearing, answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, and he's probably implying self-righteous religious types, but sinners to repent. This story is in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels. This is repeated in all of them because it's so important that we understand it because there's something Jesus has been doing that this kind of captures the heart of Jesus' strategy is befriending and enjoying people. Yes, the preaching of the Word is critical and the prayers and, you know, the healings and all that, but we cannot miss this. This is something that the church in America has lost is if they're not going to be coming in here to the building to hear and meet and experience this great koinonia going on, will we go out there and befriend them and go to their parties or invite them into ours? Amen? You see... All these tax collectors and sinners, it's not that they had nothing, but it's that they were seeing there is a, a grander, greater call in life than what they're experiencing. And there is, you know, the emptiness in the soul. There is pain in the life. And Jesus is somebody that's attractional. Man. It wasn't just the power of his words. This is good truth. You ever talk to somebody, you can tell just in the character of who they are, whether they like you or not? That, that it's not just, hey, believe what I believe, but it's like they really love you? I mean, that's, that's transformational. And the gospel has to be anchored not just in truth but in love, amen? Amen. He became friends with the worst of sinners because Jesus just enjoys their company. It wasn't a have to. He cares. And so we, like Jesus, have to bridge the gap. You know, who are your buddies? You got to bridge that gap because they don't know Jesus yet and they're missing out on the full life. They're still mostly dead. I, did you capture, coming back to this story, Levi becomes saved, become, puts his faith in Jesus, and what's the first thing he does in verse 29? He made a great feast. This is a party. And he, he didn't, his whole new lifestyle was not changed. I'm sure there was the extravagant food and, and the lot of booze. And that's not, we're not talking about for Christians, let's just drink lots of booze because we're not to be drunk, but we are to reach the world. And he brought in all those tax collectors, friends showed up. Why would they do that? On his word? Let's check out this Jesus we keep hearing about. And the sinners, all those other types. And they came just to be at the party. So what if we invited our brothers and buddies together, not brothers, well, sure, families too, sisters, brothers, family, and brought them together with your Christian brothers and sisters and invited Jesus? What would happen? You know, you ever think about that? You ever try to bring your two worlds together? We live in too much isolation. 
We kind of have this world on Sunday and another world the rest of the week. What we're needing is to build bridges and, and have times where we just hang out with the neighborhoods that God's put us in. Remember, those neighborhoods can be anywhere. And, 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 and then not just get together, but learn to love them and, and actually enjoy them. Because sometimes when we say the word love, it's like, well, it's another religious obligation the pastor is asking me to do. So I'll do it, but I won't enjoy it. <laughs> do you think people are attracted to Jesus because they sensed he didn't enjoy them? And it may be hard for us to, you know, we, have so, we have been, may have been so transformed over so many years that we forget who, what we were like, right? And it's like, well, okay, I will love them, but I don't have to like them, right? Because I'm sure Jesus didn't like everybody. Really? You think that? Could he like a tax collector? I think he really did. And again, think of the, the worst sinners of our culture and think, Jesus liked them, and then he's asking me to do the same? Can we say that we're to love our neighbors in our heart as God commanded us, but we don't have to like them, and it's okay just to keep a little distance? Don't we? We're human, so we naturally want to hang out with the neighbors we like to start with. It can be tough, right? But Jesus was not just known as a friend of sinners, They wanted to be around him, so there must have been affection there on some kind of level. You know what gets me when I look at the Gospels and Jesus' dinner parties? That who he hangs out with, the one that actually does surprise me, is the Pharisees. I mean, the Pharisees are the ones who didn't like him. And they would try and set traps for him with their words. They despised him. They even called him names. But do you know how many of those dinner parties were at Pharisee's house? When he got invited, he would go. And that just, you know, sometimes there is an attitude towards even, you know, we say the, the you know, hypocrites and religious right and stuff. And it's like, well, we know they're really going to hell. And it's like... Do you know Jesus loves them too as much as the far left liberals? It's like he just loves people. And so we need to have that. So even if at the beginning we don't like them, what do we do? We need grace. And I learned this. You know, I appreciate the difficult neighbors God's given me in my own life. In our first house uh, that we lived in, we had some wonderful neighbors and became quickly friends with them, but there was one neighbor that was difficult, shall we say. And, and, and it's like, okay, well, they don't take care of their yard. That's a first strike. But, uh, but also, man, they, uh, they're unfriendly. And, and uh, as the... And, and then the, the son seemed to take a real dislike to me, didn't really know me. And it's like, but I'm going to be a good Christian. I'm going to snow blow all the snow off their side, sidewalks, all my house and their house because they don't seem to get to it very often. So I'll help them out. But as time goes on, um, this young adult son, he's, uh, you know, even one time I'm having a prayer time with another guy in my living room. I hear yelling, and then it's like, where's that? We had to stop praying. It was so loud, and look out the window, and he's cursing me, and then he pulls his pants down and BAs me, and it's like, wow, and I started going over there because I'm now hot in the collar, <laughs> and the other guy grabs me and says, how about we keep praying, <laughs> and, uh, and then I, I call the mom that's at work, and it's like, this is what's happening, and oh, and then she explains, you know, you know, some things going on in his life, and he hears his, my, 
he hears my voice in his head, and it's all now it's getting spiritually weird. And and it even at, you know at a couple times it became it felt a little unsafe, and uh, I had to actually call the police once when he showed up at my door. And it's like threaten me, sure, I'll be martyr for Jesus, but you do not threaten my family. And uh, and you know, but it, all the time, you know, it's going on, and, and they're gonna like, hey, we'll put restraining. It's like, no, don't put restraining orders on them. What about the church? And it's like, I threw you guys under the bus. It's like, no, let him come to church if this is what it takes. He's going to, because he was threatened to, you know, just humiliate me. I don't know what that meant. But we did have strategic people with a lot of muscle ready in case there was a problem. Don't worry. And uh, you're always safe um, in Jesus. And, uh, <laughs> but can you imagine now when the snow comes again? Oh, and then the, and then her, uh, her huge tree fell on our 50-year-old pine, and she just didn't, wasn't bothered, and it snaps it and destroys it. And it's like, hey, now my tree's destroyed after I said, hurry, get the, you know. And it's like, uh, well, I don't see how that's my problem. And it's like, so I'm going to shovel your snow now? No way. And I didn't because they're difficult neighbors. And then the next time I'm doing my dr- sidewalk, it's like his father's gone. So you're not going to keep going? You know, I got to the property line. <laughs> and it's like, well, come on. They're, they got a brand new big snowblower anyway. They could use it. And then, then that young guy, he's younger than I am. He could. It's like, so did you forget the grace I showed you? So when you have difficult, and I had to start praying, Father, give me your grace because I'm lacking grace. I don't have it within me to keep liking them. But that turned into some cool stories and even um, helping them throw a party when their house burned down (laughs) and they had to get a new house built. And it's like, hey, let us help you invite neighbors. And, and, you know, so it's like, Sometimes you are going to need grace. So I, the point was, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. But it's eternal stuff that we're trying to do, right? So uh, it was providential that Rick uh, came up and gave me a, a bottle of water. No, this was not set up. But I want to give you an excellent Example of how you can be strategic and uh, and befriend and enjoy your neighborhood and even introduce them, which will be the third key step. Um, Rick is a bus driver, and uh, for kids all the way from K to high school, right? And and so. Rick begins with, and he hasn't even heard this message. He started doing this years ago. He's just much wiser than I am. He meets with a group of other bus drivers he collected and has breakfast and prays for the students. So he begins to pray. And and I didn't realize that these bus drivers pray over every seat because that's their neighborhood. They pray, he says, for their safety. He prays that they understand they are loved, that they, they pray for their identities, and that they would find God. Then when the manager of the bus drivers needs surgery, they offer to pray for her, and she lets all of them come into her office. And this group of prayer warriors then prays for the manager. Pray. And then... Rick befriends and enjoys the kids and loves them even when they cause trouble. And he helps them learn simple truths, things that are things that Jesus teach, like be kind, ask for forgiveness when the students get angry at one another. And And Rick recognizes that they're acting out of a place of pain. They're in tough homes, some of these kids. No, only one parent 
or divorcing parents. Not enough of this or that, and it's tough. And so he befriends the kids, and he enjoys them, and he gives them fun facts. Do you know that on this day that the first astronaut, he makes a bridge. And so he tells them a fun fact every day he picks them up. And then, uh, and I just have so so much respect for you, Rick. But then on special days, he dresses up, whether it's the elementary kids or the high schoolers. If we can get the lights, for example, this May 4th, he dressed up a chihuahua. (laughs) May the 4th be with you. (laughs) The next picture. And here he is, you know, with all the kids in his bus. And how goofy is that? You know, he's... The one guy that wears a suit coat here on Sundays, but he's not afraid to to put it all out there, (laughs) you know, the rest of the week. And so, thanks. (laughs) We can get the lights again. And so, you know, the parents can't help but love a bus driver like this guy. Because they're seeing him when he picks them up and then when he drops them off. And it even turns into opportunities to introduce Jesus, like one of the parents just recently, it bef- uh, school just ended this week, but, you know, saying, hey, um, he's got a lot of anger right now, and um, he's difficult. And Rick can say, can I pray for him? It's like, yeah. This is, this is a brilliant strategy, people, to be friend and really enjoy the problems in the world. So that was my third key, is to introduce your neighbors to Jesus. So how can you imitate Jesus in the way he loves people and befriend your neighbors? How can you imitate him in those relationships? But how can you throw a Levi party? Do you know who Levi was? He had another name. Take a stab at it. Come on, you Sunday school ex-students. Matthew. Matthew. You mean the guy that wrote the whole book, the gospel of, called Matthew that talked about Jesus? Yeah, one really terrible, despised tax collector became instrumental for you and me and, and for those that come after us. When Jesus loved him and befriended him. And so, introduce your neighbors to Jesus. I like how he brought the different people together. How might you do that? It's like the, the opportunities are out there. I, we have sign-ups for campfires. Heck, Sign up for a campfire. I've done this twice now. And I invite neighbor guys to come when the men have a campfire. And do you know what? I've had three different neighbors come to the campfires because I want them to meet you. I'm not ashamed of you. I understand you don't want to invite me because you're embarrassed about me. Actually, no, somebody just uh, this week dropping off tables for a dawn for a, a garage sale. A neighbor is helping them. And the first thing she says, hey, this is my neighbor or my pastor. It's like, you know, say, hey, this is, these are my buddies from church. I tell them, hey, I got some buddies from church coming over. We're going to have a campfire, play some corn husk toss. And it's like, they come. One of them's come to church for the Christmas Eve service. How cool is that? We, we announced a, camp, uh, a camping trip, church camping trip. We've had people do it before. You know, a neighbor likes camping? Invite them along. Say, hey. You know, and it's fun. It's a safe place for the kids to run around. We have campfires, eat good food, you know, and uh, and then we even do a crazy talent show on Saturday night. And, yeah, there's a a service at the lake. We sing some psalms and watch people get baptized. You don't have to go to that part, but just come. It's a cool place. You'll like it, right? How many times can can we, you know, have these parties with Jesus? So the fourth 
step is to recognize where they need Jesus. So in John 4, verse 35, Jesus says this. He says, do not say that there are four months, then comes the harvest. Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see the fields are white for harvest. Now, Jerry took us through the passages on what is the harvest and what is, you know, and what is, what's that symbolically mean? He helped us understand how plentiful and the need is great. But then I love how uh, the, uh, Eric then helped us last Sunday really understand that the story in John 4 is a, of a Samaritan woman that the Jews looked at as hopeless and lost and their religion all messed up, and how Jesus saw in her a woman who was thirsty, spiritually thirsty, not just physically. And he, and he showed us how we can navigate through our conversations, how to help people and introduce them to Jesus, but see the need. And so did you catch, well, and let's get that verse up there again, verse 35. Look, it says, three, three times he makes the point of, are we recognizing the need out there? He says, look, lift up your eyes, see that the harvest fields are white or ripe, maybe your translations have. In other words, the cool part of this strategy is it's not hard. The fruit's ripe for picking. You, didn't, you don't have to plant the tree. You don't have to prune it. You don't have to water it. He's given us an easy strategy. Just hang out and watch, right? And so like the Samaritan woman, you know, she, she knew she was trying to find love and had failed miserably five times. And in desperation, she enters into a current relationship that is futility that she would not even choose for herself. And, and it's not, she knows it's not even right, but she's desperate. She's thirsty for love. And Jesus could see that and call it out on her. And she was ripe for the picking, meaning she was ready to experience God's love. Because is this working for you? That was kind of what he's saying. And we reach this place where we hear a, a neighbor's need. And it's like, what are you doing? You know, how are you handling that? And it's like, wow, can I pray for you? You know, and start there. But maybe it's like, hey, how's that working? Because when I've been in that situation, for me, maybe you get a chance to say, Jesus Christ, I turned to him. And I got this church, this community of people where we help one another when it's just too much. You see, God's spirit was already working in this woman's life. And all the, Jesus is saying, you didn't even recognize it. You just saw a Samaritan woman and wondering, why am I talking to her? Look. Watch. See. It's time. And so in Luke 5, verse 30 through 32, that's why it ends with the Pharisees grumbling, but Jesus saying in verse 31, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Jesus is a, like a physician who cares. He, he gave his whole career like a physician to healing, meeting needs, saving lives. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So we show them not judgment when we find out they're making terrible choices. But in love, we call them into the presence of Christ. When Jill and I first got married, um, she had to get a temping job, you know, coming from England and didn't have a career and needed to go to school and stuff. But she started telling me about her boss at work, and this guy uh, had a lot of troubles. And, uh, and it was very clear no one liked him. And this, we're talking about the mid-'80s, so you've got to have context. 
you know, be thinking here, what is that, 35 years ago, right? Different world than we live in now. And she was hired to compensate for his issues and struggles. He was a manager. And, uh, and so Jill felt like people do not accept him as a human being. And so we invited him and his boyfriend to come on over and prepare them a meal. And Jill had already shared that, you know, she is a Christian and believes in Jesus. And, and they come in and there is a lot of tension. And because uh, and, and they were just very concerned about what Christians, how they'll be treated. But why did we have them over? We obviously wouldn't like them, certainly not accept them as human beings. And it was, I'll never forget it. First, it was when I said, would you like some uh, soda with dinner or a glass of wine? They relaxed. You know, and it was so like, wow, something just shifted. that I said, can I just ask, <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> you know, well, we didn't know if you drank soda. <laughs> you know, or wine. <laughs> and it's just like, I didn't, I, I wanted to laugh, but it's like, wow, what's your picture of Christians? And we wanted them to know that we value them as human beings. And no, we don't in, accept the things in their lives that would cause them harm spiritually in their lives, but we love them. And we just had a fun dinner party. And we had pre-invited Jesus to come. That's what we're needing to do, people. We're needing to party with Jesus. Who knows the difference it will make? And it may just start with shoveling driveways, providing a meal, meeting them in a time of need. And I can't tell you how many times. Some of them, I never see the fruit of that. But some of them find Jesus along the way. They come to church. I help them meet you. You guys are so cool. So let's do that this summer. But ask yourself, those moments come. And, and when you, do you see the needs of your neighbor? And do you pray, Jesus, what are you up to right now? And how can I join you in this? You ever do that? It's kind of like sometimes we see the problems like, oh, I'm sorry. And, and we'll just even, you know, it's like good to say, well, I pray. But do we take it the next step and, and say, and you ever do that silently? You're listening to them with one ear, but you're spiritually listening with the other ear and saying, okay, Jesus, what do you want me to say to them? How can I be an encouragement and help to them? So recognize where they need Jesus and help them experience there's a God that cares about them. So I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up, but I want to leave you with these words up front. What's our mission? Our mission is to devote every area of our lives to join Jesus on his mission to redeem and restore the lost, in our neighborhoods. And what is our strategy? Party with Jesus. It's a lot of fun. Bow your heads. I'm going to pray. And I want to, in these series, we were wanting to end every message with just an opportunity to invite Jesus into your own life. It just, and, and it's simple. And we'll, we'll give you, every person will give a different version of that. But you do not need to be intimidated about, hey, what if someone really is ripe for the picking? Because we want them to know a Jesus who loves them. We want the, them to have what? Full lives, not to be partially dead, mostly dead. We want them to be fully alive in Christ. So bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want to pray for anyone here or live, uh, watching live. If you happen to plug in this morning and say, 
if that's Jesus, I want him in my life. And all you need is to be in this place where like being a patient in the doctor's office, not pretending and saying spiritually, I need you to save me, Jesus, because I am a sinner and there is brokenness in me and I'm tired of living with the pain in my life and I want you to come heal me. I want what you offer in salvation. And I will surrender my life to you. I will call you my Savior and my Lord. I will follow your ways. I will follow your teachings. I will do the best I can. And if I fail, will you forgive me again? And I want to thank you that your love just is offered to me without these conditions other than I trust you. And so I ask that you give me all that you have, all your love. I need it. I ask that you heal me. I ask that you change the way I think. And so I align up with the way you look at life. Let me know who I am because I'm not sure. Help me know when you say I'm a son or or a daughter of God. Help me believe that too. And let me live a life that reflects your love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. And I lift up, Lord, us that have already started our discipleship and following you. Let our hearts be burdened and desire to cross those streets. It's awkward. feels a little scary. We're going to need some grace. We're going to need some more love. We're so used to isolating our life with you from the life we live in the world. Let us not be afraid for them to collide. Let us have Levi parties where we bring our buddies together with our Christian brothers and sisters. Let us even step out on the ledge where we in faith tell the people that you care. But we're going to need your Holy Spirit. We're going to need to hear your voice. But let us take the little bit we have and offer this redemption and restoration in your name, Lord. Amen. Let's stand now as we close with worship. Father, we love you, we worship.